Hello. Is this on? So before we get started, hopefully you're going to hear a difference in this episode and in future episodes to come. We were able to record the podcast using the new podcasting gear that you guys made possible. So I just want to take a moment to thank all the people that have signed up to be monthly subscribers on the YouTube channel and for the podcast. This is your contributions at work. And in addition, this episode is also supported by the folks at the Art of Survival Century bike ride. You can learn all about the event at survivalcentury.com. It takes place on Saturday, May 26th, and it's a whole weekend of bike fun. The ride takes place right where Northern California and Southern Oregon meet. So that's Siskiyou County, Klamath County, a real beautiful part of the country. On Saturday, you have options to do a full century, a half century, a shorter family-friendly ride. And on Sunday, there is a whole slew of gravel grinder events now. And all these rides take place around the Lava Beds National Monument. So learn more about this weekend of bike fun at survivalcentury.com. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. In today's episode, we're going to interview Lael Wilcox. She is one of the most well-known, well-respected women in the bikepacking and endurance cycling space. We're going to talk about what she thinks about on these super intense long rides, what's been her strangest meal, the GRIT program, a program she started with her friend Kate to inspire more young girls in Alaska to get into biking and bikepacking. And we also talk about her going full roadie with a tarmac and the ride that she's planning around that bike. Uh, I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. So let's jump right in. So today's guest, you probably are familiar with her name and a lot of her accomplishments. We're super stoked today to have Lael Wilcox on PLP Talks. Thank you so much, Lael, for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So catch us up a little bit. You're Right now, you're currently in Tucson. You're just kind of thawing out. <laughs> yeah, so I came down to Tucson for the winter um, I've actually spent the last month working at a pizza place, which I'm trying to stop doing by Thursday. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I'm uh, starting work with the cyclist menu, uh, leading gravel camps in southern Arizona until the end of March. Oh, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then in between there, I'm actually going to fit in a, a big ride. I'm flying out to uh, Morgan Hill to specialized headquarters. Um, getting fit on the new tarmac and then riding it back to Tucson. Oh, wow. <laughs> my, new, my newest project. It just came together this week, but I'm pretty pumped. Cool. Uh, to do that. So yeah. how long is that ride going to be? Uh, I still, you know, I'm still working out the route. It's going to be all road, but I think about a thousand miles. Wow. And I'm going to try to send it through Joshua Tree, um, through, uh, I was looking at Los, pa- Los Padres National Forest maybe Angeles National Forest, you know, hit all kind of the green areas, especially the ones with nice paved roads. Um, And yeah, and then just, you know, more direct route would be like 850 miles, but I think making it a little bit longer might make it a little more scenic. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, good weather for the winter. I'm still like, I'm not sure how cold it's going to be in the Bay Area at this (laughs) time. I'm used to like a 75, 80 degree weather down here. Yeah. My shock. <laughs> you have to reacclimate. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so I hope it doesn't rain. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be fun. That'll be on starting January 30th. So in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the long rides that you do. I've always been curious about what, what do you think about when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you've been hammering for, for hours? Yeah, I, uh, it's all, it's all over the place, you know, it's like, but at this point, at first I felt like there was so much to think about. My mind would just kind of spiral out and I'd be kind of out there. I never get bored, but now I've actually started listening to music some also because I feel like it helps me like ride faster than even like after hours, I'm still super engaged to ride faster. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just. I, I just think about everything, you know, and I'm, I'm usually like, I'm rarely, I, I'm almost always happy to be out there. Mm-hmm. Um, the racing, you know, definitely there's a higher element of pain involved. So that's not as much fun. Um, but the long rides where it's just like, especially when it's just self self motivated, um, then I feel like, well, if I wanted to stop, I would have just stopped and I usually don't want to stop. So. Right. <laughs> I guess the one thing that stops me is sleep. That's it. (laughs) Do 
you find it do you find that it's easier or harder uh to keep going when it's like a like a self-inflicted ride as opposed to like a race environment you know like a for a race i'm definitely gonna crunch the more miles in a smaller window um because if things like the weather if it's terrible weather and i'm just riding on my own i just pull over and just call it for until it clears up but a race you don't really have that luxury Mm -hmm. you just have to push through everything or like a terrible headwind you know it's like if i'm by myself i might just hitch and be like forget this this is terrible (laughs) or just turn around and go the other way you know and the race you just have to do it and you're like okay this is a hundred mile stretch it's straight into the headwind and there's nothing i can do about it Right. And at the point you just try to not hate your life. <laughs> <laughs> what are do you what are some of the mental games or tricks that you play to keep yourself motivated when when you're hitting a low point in a race? Um one major thing is that I just tell myself that it's going to get better. It'll probably get better in a, in an hour. I'll check in with myself again in an hour and I'll probably feel better than I do right now. Um just knowing that, you know, the the worst time is not going to last forever that I am going to enjoy it again. Cause I, because I guess after having the experience, you know that it's going to come around. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one. Um, and then or the, the idea of like, well, even if you feel bad, just keep going. Who cares? You know, it's like, what am I going to do? Stop. I guess I think about the other options of what I could be doing or how I could deal with the situation. And then, you know, having a bad attitude about it, it's not going to make it better. Right. I always <laughs> run faster if I'm happy. So, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the low stuff it happens, but that's not the 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 dominant feeling of of the ride. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a small percentage. What do you? What helps you recover generally? Is it do you mm-hmm. just eat more food, or is there like what what helps kind of switch the tide in a in an event? Um, recovery. You know, sleep's the best. Like for the Trans Am, I slept five hours a night, which was actually pretty big. Um, that's like a lot of sleep for that kind of race, but I felt like I, I needed to, cause it was so long, you know, the whole thing took 18 days. It's like, you're out there for more than two weeks. You can't really go into like a huge sleep hole. Mm-hmm. Um, sleep's the best. I just eat a lot and, and you kind of start hating it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for that, it was really like chocolate milk, milk. It was like my legs were dead and then I just drink this milk and then they're like back. Wow. <laughs> it was like hurt my stomach, but then my legs would just like start going again that was huge you know I felt I guess you find the things that like the fuel that keeps you riding but it's like not that easy to find because it's all from gas stations and so it's like well I'd have chocolate milk I'd have yogurt sometimes I have like uh tomato juice you know mixing those is not good right Uh, (laughs) (laughs) so so it sounds like most of your nutrition is is real food you don't rely on like weird powdered mixes and stuff like that or yeah i've never have um well because that stuff's not really that accessible unless you like have a home base and you just keep going back to it or you have a sag and then they just like provide that stuff for you so i've never really used that i'm getting um some nutrition from goo now mm-hmm. like the stroop waffles and the the gels and i actually kind of like those because the gels oh man if i could find gels at gas stations i'd be <laughs> thrilled because those are like instant kind of rocket fuel Mm -hmm. um so i do you do have some of that stuff i guess it's like for the endurance riding the quantity of food is so huge that it's like you mix it all you know it's like potato chips (laughs) hot dog chocolate milk like it's just like kind of constant i mean i can't believe i can process all this stuff it's disgusting (laughs) (laughs) what's what's the strangest meal that you've assembled from a gas station (laughs) oh man no i bad one you know actually probably one of the worst ones was on a bike tour because it was like we were out of food and then the gas station it wasn't even a gas station I think it was like a bar they didn't really have anything I remember once I had like Fritos like in a bowl like cereal style with a slim fast wow (laughs) (laughs) that was probably the worst yeah (laughs) vanilla slim fast (laughs) It's almost like a Frito pie, almost. Yeah, <laughs> sweet. <no. laughs> that was gross. I mean, it's like weird, weird stuff like that. You know, I've ended up now I eat a lot of like little individual string cheeses, which is pretty gross. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. You know. 
So what's your favorite part about doing these endurance races? Is it kind of just a self-satisfaction of uh, completing it, of setting records or pushing yourself? Yeah. I mean, the, the overall, like the dream to um, attack it, you know, that's kind of um, consuming. It's like I, I like set my sight on on doing this one race and trying to win it. So it's like the, the lead up to that's pretty cool. And then the experience itself is like, you know, some parts of it are pretty gritty, but I do like just spending that much time outside. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you're forced to, it's like, if you're only <laughs> sleeping five hours a night and you might be sleeping outside too, you're awake and riding for, you know, 19, 18, 19. And so it's like the amount of terrain you get to see, and, and then feel and the weather you're experiencing and like the scenery, it's always changing. So that part is, is probably the best part of the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then having that much kind of quiet time to just let your mind go anywhere it wants, mm -hmm. um, which is broken up by like, okay, now I have to eat. Now I have to, <laughs> you know, put a jacket on and I have to do this. And then the, the hours where you feel really good and are riding really fast. Um, that's kind of an amazing thing is that, you could be, you know, eight days into a race and the 11th hour and all of a sudden it's like you have lakes and you can just go so fast. And it's like, how does your body do that? How does it recover and then and then be able to excel again? Um, I think that's pretty cool. I think also kind of the physical experience of it, how you see. I mean, it's like you're you have terrible. I had terrible knee pain for the first week of the Trans Am, just so sore and tight. And then the second week it was totally gone. <laughs> I was like, I felt, I felt good again. And I was like, Whoa, how do you, how do you just, um, get through that? You know, it's like you kind of overcome these, um, physical, physical pains or kind of barriers or pressure to just keep going. Um, mm -hmm. I like that. I also like that there is an end, you know, <laughs> sometimes you feel like you're going to be out there forever. And then, uh, you're like, well, no, this is actually going to end. I mean, I, I look at this trans am took 18 days and then people are racing around the world minimum 90 days. Like, Oh my God, you feel like you're going crazy out there. It's like, right. it's never going to end. <laughs> I just don't, there's a girl actually recently, Amanda Coker. She just rode a hundred thousand miles the fastest anyone's ever ridden it in wow. like 400 days or something like that. Wow. <laughs> um, he set the mileage record for how many miles riding, um, in a single year. And it's like 80,000 or something like that. I mean, like this is, this is unreal, you know, relative. I mean, I feel like what I'm doing is weird, but I'm like, that's you, every single day you wake up with the intent of riding over 200 miles for an entire year. You know? <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> it's like, so I think about like what I'm doing and then there's always somebody like way crazier. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's usually like the first thing that runs through your mind when you complete an event, like thank God it's over. Or are you really just kind of planning the next adventure? Uh, yeah, I guess. No, I'm just like uh, pretty much probably just, just want to sit down and take my shoes off because my feet <laughs> hurt so bad. <laughs> <laughs> wearing those shoes for so long it's like you just want to take your shoes off with your socks yeah and then sit down and then it's like people always ask they're like hey i'm gonna meet you at the finish what do you want me to bring what do you want to eat you know all the stuff and i'm like nothing i just <laughs> water <laughs> not not free those in slim fast i take it <laughs> <laughs> or anything that sounds like it would be amazing you know it's like you're so burnt out of everything that you just just want to kind of go to more of a natural state where you just have water, you sleep and that's it, you know? Um, but yeah, a relief that it's over. Yeah. Um, and if I, you know, accomplish something big, I'm pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that doesn't usually feel real until like I'm, you know, a hundred miles from the finish. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm actually going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> how do you, how, what was your pacing strategy for something like the Trans Am? Oh man, it was bad. Uh, <laughs> I went out day one, just totally balls to the wall, like riding as fast as I could for, you know, about 280 miles. Like, especially the first bit, I was just, cause I was so excited. I was just like sprinting and then like hammering up these hills. And I remember Jay Peterberry was out there and he was like, what are you doing? Cause I was just <laughs> too bad. Yeah. It's, uh, 
And then day two, I was just totally toasted. I was like, man, you know, I have this little cycling computer. I'm like, why can't I go faster than 12 miles an hour? <laughs> like, I was kind of depressed. I was like, because I was totally, so toasted. You know, mm-hmm. I'd never really ridden road. I I just do everything by feel. But road riding, you kind of do have to rein it in a little bit. Like, uh, you just can't go 100% on the hills. You'll have nothing left for the flats. And you actually do have to ride the flats fast. Mm-hmm. So that's what I learned um, over the next week of the Trans Am was how to ride flats because there's actually a lot of them in that race. And then in the east, once we got into um, Missouri, super hilly. And so then from there, I actually did really well. Mm-hmm. So I love the hills. Um, so I could just kind of ride whatever I felt at that point. And it's actually to your benefit to kind of get up and over stuff and um, be able to be in and out of the saddle. So pacing was all over the all over the place. It was not consistent. It was not scientific. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was all feel, you know, and I actually rode with Evan for, I mean, at least a week. So he was more consistent, especially in the flats. He was like, all right, I'm just going to kind of set the pace for us. We, you can't draft. So he'd mm-hmm. be a couple bike lengths ahead of me. And I would just kind of focus on being steady with riding the way he was, which mm-hmm. was really cool learned a lot from him yeah so do you do you train or ride with like power or heart rate now or is it still pretty much by feel <laughs> i feel i mean i i do think about it like if i was to do i think for building up to kind of a road or dirt road endurance race power would really help um just to be consistent you know it's like and i i don't even know i was just thinking about this i don't even know if i'd have to train that much with it i just have to have kind of an overall feel of of output and, mm-hmm. and just kind of figuring out what's a good output for, for the terrain. Right. And it's like power numbers are not impressive, <laughs> like 100 watts or something, like <laughs> pretty wimpy. But it's like that's actually what you want to do, like on flat terrain or, you know, into a headwind if you're in an endurance race just to be consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that would help. I just haven't done it yet. You know, I've never had a coach and I've never done this training. People have all these spreadsheets and I don't know what any of it means. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't know your watts per kilogram? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Have you done any power stuff or heart rate stuff? Uh, n- a little bit. Like Laura and I um, got into the lottery for DK uh, this year. So like in, you know, we're, we typically, typically don't ride fast or long distance. So we're kind of trying to navigate those waters. Like, okay, what's, how do you pace yourself? What's the appropriate power output, uh, for, for an endurance event, you know, cause you're on the saddle for, for 10 plus hours. So it's a different story than if it was like a two hour effort or something. So, right. yeah. Oh, congratulations. Thanks. That's, that's I think. cool. Are you looking forward to it? Are you uh, kind of like- <laughs> uh, yes and no i mean uh it's an event that we've been kind of fascinated by and it's also kind of writing that we've never really done before so it's kind of interesting to to try something new and see what the body can do um and it's kind of just a creative it's gonna be a creative challenge like telling that story via video online and everything so i'm looking yeah. forward to like different aspects of it <laughs> yeah that's yeah a huge event man that's really kind of taken over everything yeah um, that's <laughs> so, cool though yeah so before cycling you were already an athlete before you're actually a runner right mm-hmm. can you talk yeah, a little bit so, about running and do you still run these days i do still run yeah <laughs> so i started running in the end of high school um i ran a marathon right after high school and then I ran in college. Um, but running really is uh, kind of my that's my favorite sport, I guess. It's my favorite thing to do. It's my favorite feeling. Uh, I s- still even with riding. I, I think the more the more I've ridden, the more that's kind of changing. Um, I, I, I went through like a long period where I really kind of hated my bike. <laughs> <laughs> it just felt like this like kind of invasive, like this foreign object like I don't I like especially if I started feeling frustrated I just well you know one of my first thoughts was like I just want to get rid of this bike like I just want to throw the bike away (laughs) I wish that I didn't have this bike with me you know I just want it on my feet because I really wanted to be running or hiking or just like more more of a simple thing Mm -hmm. 
but now it's like I definitely accepted the bike. <laughs> <laughs> do you th- um, but yeah, what were you gonna say? Um, do you think because of your your biking background, cycling came easier? Like, what, were there some kind of advantages to having been a runner first? Oh yeah, I mean, your running's more physically. Um, I don't know. Your body feels more like it's being kind of jolted around, so you're more used to that. Um, definitely getting your heart rate up, you know, working really hard. Um, I think even climbing really, I I remember that being one of the biggest barriers starting cycling was the climbing, just like even going up a pretty small hill. It's like, that's so hard, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to do it. And you're like, (laughs) you would rather just be walking up the hill and it takes a while to get used to that. I guess that's really kind of one of the biggest hurdles I think. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, I think running helps, you know, it's like, knowing how to push yourself um but fun odd, oddly enough I never thought I would push myself on the bike I always just saw it as like a, a vehicle like a way to get to work um and then later for touring like a way to travel you know a way to carry gear I never really I never considered racing or doing anything competitive or even like working that hard on the bike mm-hmm. um, and then I just um I guess I got into it because of the ultra endurance stuff because I was already doing these long rides anyway. So then I decided just to enter a race, like to compete and see how it was. And then I realized, wow, I'm actually really good at this and, and I'm having fun working really hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> was that a revelation? Like you were like, man, I could actually <laughs> be competitive in this space. <laughs> yeah. It was surprising. Well, it's also like I'd ridden long miles, but I'd never um, kind of, string them together day after day. Um, so you just actually, I don't think anybody can know that they can do that until they do it. Um, that you have the, the kind of body that will recover. Cause mm-hmm. I, I mean, I kind of can't believe we're doing this stuff. You know, it's like hammering our bodies and then sleeping for four hours and <laughs> doing it again for weeks. You know, it's like, how, how can you keep doing that? And, and your body holds up to it. And then, you know, you feel like kind of all, um, you feel pretty bad at the end of an event, but then, you know, a month, two months later, your body fully recovers. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is (laughs) incredible. You know, it's like, and I guess, so that, that's one thing my body will do it. And then I'm willing to do that. (laughs) 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 I mean, I don't know why, you know, how many people actually, I'm amazed how many people actually attempt these events. Cause it's like, do you actually want to do that? Cause I actually kind of thrive in that atmosphere like i i'm having fun right you know? and it's like that's a kind of a, an anomaly i think i don't think most people are actually having that much fun yeah uh, what's the where's the joy in it where's the fun part uh i i like working hard i like being inside um and then it's just kind of this uh, uh it becomes almost like breathing you know it's like you're you're just so used to riding that that's like the the spinning that's the constant and then the rest of your day is kind of like the the baseline is all the all the riding and mm-hmm. then like where your mind is it's kind of in that riding world the way you like look at everything is is from that space mm-hmm. um so i i like that yeah. um i mean yeah there are hard aspects to it but it's mostly just a good feeling to be moving and be out um and then competing if, i mean if you actually do get to kind of race people that's pretty exciting you know because it's like you get all this extra energy from the race itself I mean now I've done like some races and some kind of um time trials like my own personal battles it's definitely more fun to be in a race <laughs> it's more fun to like have other people around be trying to catch people like have the dynamics of different people have different situations going on and um mm-hmm. that's definitely a lot more energy I like both but i i prefer the race for sure do you have um how has your kind of relationship to cycling changed over the years um i guess now well you know it's like first starting commuting and then touring and then started racing some and now i'm doing all these extra kind of projects too (laughs) um I'm putting together Anchorage Grit, uh, the middle school girls cycling mentorship program. This will be the second year. We're doing that in April. I'm also hosting a women's scholarship, uh, and that'll be released February 1st. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not going to give all the details now, but it's pretty cool. It's cool to 
not only just be writing myself, but now I feel I've found that I'm in a position where I can encourage other people to ride, um, through what I do, but also to provide bikes and provide equipment and provide opportunities, which is amazing. It's an amazing place to be. And it's, you know, I just ask a company has people within a company, do you want to put this together with me? And they're wow. all for it, you know, and this is like, we're putting something out there that somebody we don't even know at this point, it's going to, um, receive and take off with. And that's, um, that's a cool thing to be doing. It's, it's a lot of extra work, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also like I, I, now that I know I can do that, I, I want to do as much of that as I can, you mm -hmm. know, so it's fitting it all in. Um, but I always liked that idea, you know, it's like I applied for scholarships. I, I wanted to, when I was in seventh grade, I wish something like grid existed where I was like in a, you know, a cycling group that went for a three day ride, um, in, in Alaska, you know, it's like, I, I always wanted something like that to happen. So now it's like, well, I can just do it. You know, I can just create this, which is, is really cool. Right. Um, and you know, it's, and the, the other cool thing is how much support I'm getting just for these ideas. People are like, um, yeah, we want to help you in any way we can. You know, I put it, put the idea out and, and the outpouring of like other creative ways to approach this or helping with gear or helping with, um, you know, volunteering time. It's like, it's there seem like no barriers to make something happen which is kind of amazing um so that's cool i'd like to see it grow i'd like to not be like the organizer for all of this i'm really bad at that <laughs> <laughs> well that's but awesome yeah, that you've, you've been able to to turn um you know your your presence in cycling into to something where you can you know pay it forward and, and inspire uh future writers yeah. I mean, it's great too. Cause it's like the, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I like the touring and I like the racing, but it's like, that's not all of it. You know, it's like, and it gets old just to be like, it's about me on my bike. And mm -hmm. you know, I was like, the, how much is that actually? I mean, I, I want to get more people excited for them to get on their bikes, you know? And I feel like doing these projects, it's like, it, it reaches, you know, this 14 girls and grit, but it also, gives other people that are watching the program the, the idea that they can do it too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, if seventh grade girls can do a three day trip. I think that almost anybody can do it, yeah. you know, if they, if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, the ni other nice thing about cycling is like, it is equipment based, but it's not that prohibitive. I mean, like the grip bikes that we got from specialized, they're, no, they're nice bikes, but they cost $500. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that, that's available for people if they want to, if they can afford a house and a car and all these other things, then they can definitely get their hands on a bike. Mm -hmm. And we have other programs. I mean, Tucson's great for it. The bikest um, community shop here is incredible. You know, it's like mm -hmm. there's so many resources and that's inspiring too, to just kind of be, be aware of that as well. And, mm -hmm. and to start learning more about how people can have access to bikes. Right. Where would you like to see, like grit go in the future? I mean, ideally, um, I, I just, I kind of want it to be more of a model that people just, um, kind of pick up and translate into their communities. Uh, the, the main concept of the program is that it's six weeks. Uh, we meet, um, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. Uh, each meeting is a ride to a workshop where they work on some kind of skill that should help them towards, uh, the end goal of going for a three night trip. Mm -hmm. um, or two night, three day trip. Um, but you know, the workshops are like safe riding, bicycle maintenance, um, mountain bike skills. We're also making bags with Revelate. Um, but then we do other fun stuff like they do a yoga session. They're meeting with this former Olympian, Holly Brooks, and she talks to them about women in sports and self-confidence. And so I feel like, you know, it's like, these are not really set classes that people, they don't necessarily need to go to these specific classes to prepare. They just need time on the bike. They need guidance and they need to work on some skills. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel like that's something, you know, in, in different communities, it could be different, um, workshops, but mostly it's just getting more girls on bikes and kind of organizing them to do a final trip. So I'd like people to kind of see that and think, well, we could, we could make a grit program. You know, I'd love to do grit in Tucson, especially because yeah. the weather's so good. Um, 
but it's always like if people are actually from a community and um, have connections to other women, um, it's easier to set up, you know. So we're working with uh, public schools, which I think is great. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like kind of if people had the idea like they wanted to make Tucson Tucson Grit, um, you know, they could. I would be happy to field their questions, help them set it up, but um, not really be involved in in every program so that's that's how i'd like to see it happen you know that's kind of that's kind of a dream i mean (laughs) the thing is everybody loves the program but they're like oh we love what you're doing just keep doing it they don't don't do it (laughs) (laughs) i'm like but i can only do it so much you do it if you love or they have like ideas like well why don't you do grip for boys i'm like you do grip for boys right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well in in a grit for the the grit that you've done in in alaska like what's been the most fulfilling part about that um this you know spending time with the girls they're they're coming from like feeling like they're you know going for a 12 mile ride was a huge uh accomplishment and then we went for a 25 mile ride and that was a huge accomplishment and then they went for the weekend ride and it was like at that point they're like oh this is no big deal but I know they were like in their minds are like, I can't believe I just rode 60 miles in a weekend, mm-hmm. you know, and camped out and did all this stuff. And then I caught up with them in the summer and uh, we went for a little ride to get ice cream, like a 25 mile ride. They're all doing great. Some of the girls are, you know, one girl told me that she's been riding by herself, like this 25 mile loop. Oh, wow. You know, and I saw <laughs> them. I saw them during the summer, like three of them riding together. Um you know, some of them, they call me to catch me up on what's going on. I, by the end of the program, I told them that I wanted them to be involved next year as, as mentors for the next program. And one of them wrote me like an Instagram message that said that she and two of the other girls are interested in being mentors and they want to know um, what they can do to prepare, you know? Uh, so it's awesome. like, <laughs> yeah, I mean like they're, they're coming up with the ideas, you know? And it's like, they're they're realizing they want to be more involved and they're they have more independence i mean through the program they learned how to navigate anchorage which is on a bike which is not actually that easy yeah you know it's like it's really high traffic um the routes are we do have like bike paths but they're not that accessible so for them to be doing that as 12 year olds is it's like kind of mind-blowing it's like whoa Mm -hmm. you're doing it you know they're getting (laughs) places and uh and they want to um you know, they want to be part of it again. So I think that's pretty cool to see. Um, it's a good age for that. They're, uh, they really want to take on challenges. You know, it's like I gave them options, um, during the program to make things easier, to not do such a long trip. And they're like, no, we want to do it. We want to do the hard way. You know? So (laughs) I think at some point you, people, you know, kids kind of lose that. It's like 12, 13, they're really motivated somewhere in high school. They're like, I don't have to do this stuff anymore. And they just don't care. So we, we're getting them at a good time. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so it's awesome that you've been, um, you know, an amazing ambassador for. <laughs> Sorry <blown> about up. that. <laughs> 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 so it's awesome that you've been, an, you've become an amazing ambassador for, for this sport. Was it uh, a challenge to kind of embrace that role or was it something that, that you always wanted to do? No, I mean, it's not anything I ever expected to do, um, you know, and it's like, I don't know, those, that's kind of like the endurance racing is highs and lows for sure. You know, I'm so excited about these programs and like putting so much energy in and then sometimes it feels kind of like you're getting sucked dry, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. That's the hard part. But then, you know, then I have to mentally tell myself, well, I'm going to feel better about this in an hour. I'm going to be excited about it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that's the kind of thing it's like okay um you know that i'm feeling like overwhelmed this is gonna pass or that overwhelming feeling it's like why am i feeling so overwhelmed right now it's my life situation is no different than it was half an hour ago and everything's cool <laughs> you know so it's kind of like this like mental personal coaching i guess just to keep my energy up you know stay positive which mostly I feel really positive, but you know, it's like, it's when it's all coming, like it's all self-motivated and, um, there's no real, I guess 
eh, it's not a job, you know, I'm not getting paid for this. It's like, I'm just putting a lot of time and energy into making things happen. So that's to do that. It's a, it, it can be a struggle at times, but for the most part, it's just super exciting and people are inspired and, mm-hmm. and they're doing good stuff. So mm-hmm. <laughs> almost entirely awesome, you know, and then the low moments, it's like, well, let's just get through these and, and keep it going because it's like, if, you know, if I wasn't working with Kate on grit, grit wouldn't happen, you mm-hmm. know, and as much. And then they're like, well, what about, you know, people are like, well, what about the girls at the other school that schools that don't do grit? And I'm like, well, I mean, if <laughs> let's let's just focus on somebody's getting to do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, it. Like, what about the other 200 people that applied for the scholarship that don't get the bike? I'm like, well, at least somebody's getting the bike. Right. Otherwise, no. No, otherwise nobody's getting it, right. you know? So it's like those, th- those things can be kind of hard, you know, it's like you create something and then other people feel left behind. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just life though. It's like, not everybody's going to get every opportunity, right. you know, but creating opportunities is, is positive. So mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's complicated, you it know, is. Like, <laughs> feel guilty about doing something good. <laughs> But I feel like it's, you know, it's definitely a challenge when, I mean, what you do for a living doesn't have a clear roadmap when it's mm-hmm. not like clocking in or out and you're always constantly having to navigate, you know, you know, what's my purpose? What am I giving back? You know, how do I measure success and everything? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a challenge. And, and people, other people are questioning it too, you know, cause it's like you're doing something different and they're like, well, what's the point of that? You know, cause it, it kind of starts sparking ideas for them. Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so yeah, that's like, that is, you're, you're doing something different. Um, Mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Uh, do you, it sounds like you've been, um, the, the trip that you're planning from Morgan Hill is going to be on road. Is there, do you prefer road riding or mountain biking or or a mixed terrain or? I like the mix. Um, I mean, if I had to kind of focus on one style, I would definitely say dirt road riding. Mm -hmm. Um, like, yeah dirt road riding jeep roads or nice forest service roads that that's the ideal but i do like mixing it up i do like road because it's so fast and simple um (laughs) uh and you can cover so much distance i do like mountain biking but i don't like super technical riding i love riding on snow um but then it's like any of these styles i'm going to get kind of burnt out on them and then i'm going to be like i just want to do something totally different plus you get to ride totally different bikes for them right which is a different feel and i like that i like the change in body position and kind of the change in um what the challenge is um so i I like mixing it up for sure um i've never had a pure road bike so that's kind of what i'm pumped for for this because i'm living in tucson seeing all these people fly around it's it's all like like carbon fiber bikes uh rim brakes you know like this simplest like lightest bike i guess i I shouldn't say simplest they're like very complicated (laughs) fancy bikes but it's like they're extremely light and they just the mission is just to ride road in good weather Mm -hmm. um so i'm kind of pumped to do that you know all the bikes i've had are been it you know even for road it's like endurance road with these extra features of for comfort and like well how comfortable is just a normal road bike you know and that's kind of the the outlook for this next ride right um because you're always making compromises for comfort. You're adding weight or um, and maybe features that you don't necessarily need. So this is kind of the test for me to see, could I just be on like a normal road bike? Mm-hmm. Uh, That's cool that you're, you're open to constantly mixing up your, your style of riding. You're not like locked in or identified to like one identity, but are open to kind of exploring it all. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, people are saying say stuff like, "Oh, I'm allergic to pavement." I'm like, "No, you're not." <laughs> like, it's fine, especially here. It's like tons of bike lanes. It's great for it, you know. And then sometimes it's like you get so hammered on a trail that uh, you're like, "All you're wishing for is like a road." Like your, the Arizona Trail. It's like I was so beat up when I finally like got to the road. I was like, "It's a road!" I was like celebrating because it's like the easy life, you know. All of a sudden, you're just rolling along like no problem. Right. <laughs> so, I don't know. I like the mix, you know, and I think physically it's good to mix it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, do you have any other events that you have your, your eye on doing in the future? Um, definitely doing some, uh, some kind of race this summer. Um, I haven't quite decided what yet. I've been looking at um, doing a race in Switzerland in June. Um, it's called the Nevada 1000. It's a thousand mm-hmm. kilometers and something crazy like 30,000 meters of climbing wow. <laughs> <laughs> like in the foothills of the Alps. And I think that'd be cool because it's not super long and it's a ton of climbing. And at that point, I won't be in that great of shape because I've just been doing grit. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be riding while I'm doing grit, but it's not the same as like touring and putting in a lot of base miles. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also looking at this Silk Road uh, mountain bike race in Kyrgyzstan. Um, yeah, it looks, it looks really cool. I think it's, uh, something like 1700 miles. Um, it's a new race. Um, but it's the guy who put it together has raced transcontinental. Um, and maybe, I don't know what else he's raced, but he's pre-scouted the whole route. Um, and I've just heard for years that Kyrgyzstan's a really great place to ride. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, maybe especially if I have the time in advance to go over there, tour the route spend some more time and then race it. Uh, that could be cool. Um, there's always the tour divide too, though. So yeah, <laughs> it's there, you know, yeah. it's kind of, I don't know. My thing with that is like, I, I'm still, I still want to go after the overall record. Um, but at this point there's a, a pretty heavy detour in Canada. So I don't even know if it's possible, yeah. you know, cause it's like adds like a bunch of, I've heard it adds like some hike a bike, like extra climbing. And it's like, well, then can you really accomplish the mileage you need to, to break the record, which is about 200 miles a day. Right. Um, <laughs> and that's such a great route too. It's just so classic, mm-hmm. you know, Canada, Mexico through the Rockies. And, but I don't know, I've already kind of raced it twice. So it's like, well, it's, you know, it's the new experience there. Mm-hmm. And I'm really just going for results. Mm-hmm. You know, I like the riding a lot it's really great writing but it's like it's a lot to put yourself through just to try to get you know 13 13 days and 10 hours or whatever you know quantifiable results like that's 13 days and 10 hours of like a lot of work yeah um and then if i didn't get it it's like (laughs) i just saw that and i didn't get it you know (laughs) yeah so (laughs) but that's the that would be you know the, the the goal I mean, I might just have to do it because I've been thinking about it for so long. Yeah. How do you, how do you keep yourself from burning out? Um, I don't know if I, if I'm really sick, if I'm really sick of doing it. I mean, I, I did get pretty burnt out like, uh, two years ago, you know, I, I rode to the start of the tour divide, I raced the tour divide, went back to Alaska, rode to the start again, raced the tour divide again. Then I uh, toured the Arizona trail and then I tried to race the Arizona trail. So I, I calculated that I rode like 90, like maybe just under 9,000 miles in three months. Wow. <laughs> so I was like a zombie. Like my brain didn't work right. I didn't have my, I was like, where, where'd my personality go? It's like, I was just like an eating machine. Like I, <laughs> I couldn't think straight. I'd get all like tired. Then I'd eat. I'd be all like, excited for 10 minutes and then I go back down to like <laughs> low, you know? Yeah, and I was like, yeah. at that point, super burned out. And that was actually, you know, n- with Nick, he, um, he had been working all summer. I'd been doing all this racing. And at that point he was like, I really want to go, but I really want to go on a trip now. And I was like, well, great. Go on a trip. Yeah, I'm going to hang yeah. out in Scottsdale and <laughs> Get a job. <laughs> <laughs> my grandparents you know and he was like but i want to go on a trip with you um and i was like i really don't want to ride my bike anymore like i'm done <laughs> and uh so our compromise was to go down to baja and ride and he was like we're just going to go down to baja we're just going to chill out it's going to be super easy we're going to sleep long nights because the sun goes down at five o'clock and uh it's going to be really mellow so I was like, mm-hmm. I agreed. He was, he convinced me. And then we get down there. And within two weeks, we'd taken on, you know, this Baja Divide route project, which <laughs> turned into, <laughs> into this, like, over 4,000-mile obsessive hunt to, like, ride and connect this dirt road trail through Baja through 
you know, it's like we're scouting out roads that ended up being like dead ends and then we have to ride back again. And it was like, I mean, it was, uh, it was a massive project ride, but you know, I think having the focus of it being different than a race is kind of what got me back excited. Cause it was like, well, instead of, you know, trying to ride this as fast as possible on somebody else's route, we're trying to create something to share with others. So we're like riding along thinking about like, is somebody else going to like this ride? Like, what are the things they're going to need to be successful to get through it? What things are they going to look at? Like with the eyes of, of um, thinking about other people coming through after us. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually was probably one of the most amazing projects I've ever been involved with. And then the success of it, the group start the year after and, and all we did for that was really, really cool. But that was at, that was after my biggest burnout. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess I just realized that it never ends. Yeah. It's never going to end. What, what else am I, this is like the, the side of like, Oh, what are the other possibilities? I'm going to, you know, have some other life. Like what life could be. I'm like sitting in an office I'm working in an elementary school. Like, what are the other things I actually could be doing? These possibilities don't seem real at all, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, I mean, you're so I mean, you're you're in deep in cycling. I mean, like, it would you know, what else could you, what else could you do after that that would give you as much like fulfillment? <laughs> right, where it's just like you just hit pause on your life and then, and what you know, it's like <laughs> what what are the other directions? And none of them. No, nothing I can think of. I don't really have any passion for these other ideas. You know, it's like working with kids. I love, but I don't want to be like working in inside a school. You mm -hmm. know, so it's like maybe more, maybe more things like grit, where we're taking kids outside um, with the end goal of going on a trip. You know, imagining more things that I wish that I had. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily not everybody has to. Not everybody has to create their own cycling life they can just be involved in programs and then they can move on to doing the other things they like to do you know mm -hmm. but it could be an experience for them you know because mm -hmm. i i don't think you know i don't expect other people to be kind of as obsessed as i am with all this stuff <laughs> 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 maybe they ride like to, you know 50 miles a year but it like it gives them ideas of doing other things mm -hmm. um I like that. You know, I like actually getting people doing stuff because I feel like a lot of media we have right now is like a lot of people just like spending time staring at their phones, which is like they are excited to see people like riding their bikes in beautiful places. And it does encourage them to want to do that, too. But it's like, let's actually just go the next step and get people actually doing it like right away, you mm -hmm. know, um, and then they'll learn so much. There's no barrier. You know, it's like I feel like we like touring it's like people are like well i don't have experience but you gain most of your experience within like a week or two and, you yeah. know or at that point you're like i know what i like to eat i know how i can camp and everything else and then the rest of it's a lot easier yeah um, yeah 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 i'm stoked on like your focus to kind of get people on bikes um and also kind of like shifting that focus because i know for like laura and i there was a point after about three years of travel where we still enjoyed the act of bike touring. Um, but it felt kind of like empty calories. Like it felt like overly mm -hmm. hedonistic and we weren't really plugging in or, or making a bigger change. Um, you know, there was something about like being on permanent vacation that, that stops being fulfilling after a while. <laughs> right. And you're not sharing your story. And it seems like you guys are also have a passion for creating media and doing this stuff and like engaging other people that way, which is like, you do get to be more creative too, or mm -hmm. like writing a story, you know, it's like you, the, the sharing part is really awesome, but also the personal part of like going through that process is, is pretty rewarding too. It's like you're expressing yourself instead of just like pedaling along and eating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing that, um, that struck us like about maybe year or two is that, you know, although we're doing a bike tour, it's not like the rest of our life has put on pause, that we were still developing as people and we still had other interests yeah. and other things that you, you want to fulfill. So this weird balancing act of, you know, constantly traveling, but having a big laundry list of, of things you want to accomplish at the same time. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Well, and then having other interests and projects and that keeps it more alive and um, 
I, yeah, I think like the diversity in it, because it is, it's is boring just to do the same thing day after day. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know, your, your mind probably goes to like all the other things you could be doing and how could you ignore them? Right. You know, it's like <laughs> something that you're missing. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's one yeah. one aspect I've like. The older I get, the more fascinated I get about. It's like touring um, might not be the ultimate end. It might be a means to to something else. You know, yeah. just for anyone yeah, with kind of like a vehicle. Mm-hmm. You know, because you you are in this vehicle, and then your mind is in a different place, and you're exposed to more things. Mm-hmm. But I do yeah. feel like there's still. You know, there. I mean, I will, I would like to ride my p- bike like everywhere in the world because it's the best way to learn about a place. Mm. You know, it's like you're you're like thrown in the middle of a country like Cairo, Egypt, and then you're on your bike, and all of a sudden, like you start caring about their culture and their language and like how things work and and the environment. And so I think there is like, I don't know. I guess I could I could uh, insert a bike tour into every year of my life. Right. You know, for sure. <laughs> Or or be doing other projects while while touring, you right? Because it's right. like because it's like you're never gonna run out of places to go. You know, <laughs> so there's always gonna be like another country to visit that maybe you didn't even hear of, you right. know, before you were right. there. And then by the time you like cycle back around to to the places you've already been, like now they have like a new government and. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so I do feel like you could do that forever, but if you're just doing it by yourself and you're not engaging, then like, I think that's a, that's a road to burnout. You know, I remember like getting into this and being really impressed by the people that were going on these four year trips around the world. But then like you actually talk with them and it's like, it becomes a job where it's just a drag and all they do is like do something else. <laughs> <laughs> That is true. Uh, like at, at one point, you know, I, I came to the realization that, you know, we, it seems like you ran away from all your responsibilities, but the responsibilities just changed forms. Like we're still yeah. doing laundry. We still have to like find food, the place to stay. <laughs> Making your life work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, well, this isn't that much fun. And I, I guess maybe you feel like you're not really learning that much or the experience is too much the same. Um, then you got to mix it up, you know? Yeah. I mean, my favorite reason to like totally change the plan is like if the weather just goes to hell someplace and like, let's get out of here and you just like jump on an airplane and go somewhere else. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I guess I changed the plan a lot too. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't feel too stubborn about actually riding. Like the only reason I'm stubborn about completing a route is for a race, mm-hmm. I guess. You know, like the Trans Am, I probably never would have finished that route if I didn't race it. <laughs> so I'd be like, oh, let's just go to somewhere else. You're like, what are we doing in Kentucky? <laughs> um, uh, well, I'll ask one last question. But what is your dream bike or does it does your dream ooh. bike even exist? <laughs> you know, I'm really looking forward to getting on this tarmac. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, no, I don't have a dream bike, you know, and I don't even like, I mean, I really like riding the bikes, but I don't even care about them that much. It's like, right. like I, right now I have two bikes, um, which is unusual. I usually just have one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so usually it's like I ride a bike for, you know, a few months and then sell it or give it away or whatever. And I like that. I like just having I, well, I love having a new bike. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe your favorite dream bike's a new bike. <laughs> is a new bike every three months. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> <laughs> a new, totally different bike every three months. You know, it's like ride the tarmac for three months and then get on a fab bike. You right. know, you know, whatever else. Um, that's it. Yeah. Just changing it up. Plus, the technology is always changing. So the way they ride is different. I feel like they're always coming up with like, you know, I mean, even having like disc brakes is a huge innovation. It's like, mm-hmm. oh my God, we my road bike has disc brakes or, <laughs> you know, it's like, what? <laughs> it works so well. Right. Like, I love getting a bike and like there's something new on it and you're like, oh my God, this works so well. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even have to like be involved in coming up with it. <laughs> I just get to ride it. 
<laughs> you get to do the best part. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I think. You know, there's so much work that goes into all this stuff, and then we just get to take these bikes and ride them. You know, it's amazing. Um, yeah. So no, no set, no one dream bike. <laughs> Well, cool. Uh, I think I'll end the interview here. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And if you guys enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe. If you have any other questions for Lil, leave those in the comment section below. And thank you once again, Lil Wilcox, for being on our show. Yeah, thanks a lot, Russ. Cool.